on a listen-only mode. I would now like to turn the call over to Michael. Uh, thank you, Operator. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the National Weather Service All Hands meeting. I'm Michael Wadomski, Director of Communications and Executive Affairs. Uh, today we're going to hear from uh, Director of the Weather Service, uh, Dr. Louis Uccellini. Also, will be, uh, 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 remarks will be available from uh, Dan Sobe and the National President of, the, uh, of NWCO. Um, also on the line available uh, for later on for questions that may come up is uh, CFO John Potts. Uh, you should know for those people who uh, who are on the phone. So we have uh, emailed you a link for the for the presentation. So if you are not watching this through the GoTo meeting, you uh, you do have the slides available to you. Uh, the people on the phone, unfortunately, we are not able to to take questions on the phone. We will be able to take questions from here in the room. But as uh, as normal has as we have done this before in the past. Uh, we would ask that if a, if, if a question that you have is not asked in the room and, and you do have those questions following, uh, please send those questions to nws.communications.office at noaa.gov. Uh, that would be the same address that you received the email announcement on that. Uh, again, it's nws.communications.office at noaa.gov. Um, again, um, uh, we will be able to take the questions from people in the room. Uh, so uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Louis Cellini. Thanks, Michael. Well, uh, first, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, uh, AMS conference. Uh, this was one of the was one of the goals um, of um, this fiscal year uh, was to get a uh, to get the National Weather Service and to get NOAA represented at this uh, conference, and we were able to um, get 151. People here, so I was really uh, uh, overjoyed actually to see uh, uh, the representation. What I would like to do up front before we even get into the slides is to recognize uh, those uh, employees and offices that have been um, awarded or will receive their awards um, uh, from the AMS. Some have already received those awards on Sunday, and uh, there'll be a few tonight okay, at the awards ceremony. So first of all, uh, in Southern Region, uh, the National Weather Service uh, Mobile Office uh, received the award for a specific uh, prediction for providing effective long lead time tornado warnings during the unprecedented 15 April 2011 tornado outbreak over Southern Alabama and Mississippi. And hold the applause. Let me get through all of these. But I want a, a vigorous round of applause for all these awards. Um, in, in Western Region, um, from uh, Glasgow, Montana, Tanya Franson, WCM, the Kenneth C. Spengler Award for Visionary Leadership and Innovative Thinking to Ensure Weather Forecasts Result in Timely and Appropriate Public Response by Including All Partners in, weather, in the Weather Enterprise. In Central Region, John Paul Martin at WCM at Bismarck, the Francis Reicheldorfer Award for Outstanding Leadership Exemplary National Weather Service Decision Support Services for the State of North Dakota and for local communities as warning coordination meteorologist at the Bismarck WFO. Uh, Eric Thaler, a Sioux um, uh, from Boulder, Colorado. I think he's one of the original Sioux. Is Eric you here? here? Um, the Charles L. Mitchell Award for ensuring the integrity of science and mathematics in weather analysis and forecast operations. In NSEP, Wallace Hogstad, a Sioux w, at the WPC in College Park, Maryland, he received an Editor's Award for, in Weather and Forecasting for numerous constructive and timely reviews of tropical cyclone studies that have enhanced the quality of the journal. And uh, we had one fellow elected. Um, I, I believe he's here. I know he was, no, he's probably standing out in the back. Uh, Ed Johnson uh, was elected a fellow of the AMS. So let's give all these individuals in the office a round of applause. Okay, so with respect to today's presentation, um, and um, what I would like to do uh, is to go over briefly the uh, strategic challenge, the strategic outcome. Uh, building a weather ready nation. I can tell you that this is being roundly embraced. Uh, I, I knew that coming into this conference, and certainly the partners 
the AMS partners are, um, are, are embracing it. Uh, we've had a number of people now formally signed up as ambassadors um, uh, to the Weather Ready Nation, and it's certainly uh, being emphasized um, uh, throughout. Um, I'll have one slide on the NAPA report findings. The NAPA is the, um, the National Academy for Public Administration. It's equivalent to the National Academy of Sciences. It's an important report uh, since it was commissioned by the Hill, and we continue to uh, report back uh, to the Hill um, as we uh, move in, in addressing their uh, recommendations and, um, and the like. Um, I want to give an update on the annual operating plan and budget. Uh, we have some really good news for 14 uh, after going through a rather difficult year in 13. Uh, obviously a tremendous challenge. The travel update, um, uh, the opportunity returns for students. We now have uh, reestablished, been able to reestablish a formal program to allow students to uh, start working uh, with us in our forecast offices. Um, and um, we'll uh, touch upon that. Uh, the Sandy Supplemental. Um, which is uh, the big slug of money we got um, in um, the end of February of last year, at least money that was appropriated. We didn't receive it until the end of this year, um, uh, for the most part, the end of the fiscal year. And uh, we'll uh, talk about that. And then the, because uh, that has tremendous implications uh, for a number of things we're working on, not the least of which is the computer and modeling systems that uh, you uh, increasingly rely on. OK, so uh, for those who don't know, and there will be, I hope, precious few, uh, the strategic outcome is a weather ready nation to be ready, responsive, resilient. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, you know, Atlanta last week was not weather ready. And um, you know, we, we, we had a good forecast out there dealing with a very difficult forecast issue. This was not an easy system uh, to predict. Um, and the community's decision process was not necessarily tied into that forecast process like we've seen in other places. And it's, a, it's an illustration of, of the challenges that still lie ahead for us in terms of linking our forecast uh, to those who are uh, you know, making the decisions on how and when to release people, for example, in an impending snow event. Uh, the six strategic goals um, I have listed on the right. I, I want to remind everyone that uh, those are the goals that help drive our budget process. Um, we, yes, the improved weather decision services is a, is a big driver for us. Um, but we also have uh, goals respect, uh, with respect to water, climate, um, how we partner uh, with the larger community which we have to partner with to, if this country is to become weather ready, um, the enabling the environmental forecast is becoming an increasingly important item within NOAA. When I stopped at Tampa last, uh, last Friday, I saw uh, an amazing display of where NOS um, uh, products derived off their, uh, their models that now run on our computers are being worked with by uh, National Weather Service employees. Uh, dealing with uh, an expanded set of users, uh, customers, and partners uh, now in the, uh, on the wet side. And um, really, a, really a showcase for what, you know, what can happen uh, in the future. Um, in fact, you know, I walked out of there thinking that I saw the future. Okay. Uh, sustain a highly skilled uh, professional workforce equipped with uh, training tools and infrastructure to meet mission needs. Um, you'll see this is reflected. Uh, we're recommitting ourselves to the training program in this organization and not just uh, w training on the web. I want, um, I want to get you know, this, this proper balance between uh, what we need to do face-to-face -face, um, and uh, what we do you know, uh, on station type training. So um, you know, that's, that's a very important goal for us. So, so Weather Ready Nation is about building a community resiliency in the face of increasing vulnerability to extreme weather. So we've got two things happening. We have uh, an increasing number of extreme events. Uh, that's, a, that's a fairly solid trend that we're seeing. And we have an uh, increasing number of people, um, and we have an increasing number of people living in vulnerable areas. So, um, and you can, you can look at that in practically any program, um, I think especially in terms of 
the uh, hurricane program and the fire program. All right, the, the notion that we have a fire season is, is basically gone by the boards. You know, it's 365 days uh, we have fire threats. Um, very hard to plan for. In fact, uh, when we were going through the furloughing exercises during the summer, it was the fire program that I found, you know, you know how do you manage a furlough with respect to uh, the, the prospects of a fire uh, situation which can just develop. Um, so clearly we have extreme events. Um, and these impact-based decision support services means we're taking um, our job beyond making the forecast. Um, and it's linking it to decision makers. Uh, better understanding of societal impacts through social science is, is a basis, is, is a part of that effort. Um, making our information more relevant to decision makers, uh, what they're saying, and we heard it today when we uh, visited uh, CNN, for example, who heavily rely on our products uh, for their, uh, for their uh, news and weather services, uh, they brought up consistency, okay? Uh, as an example, this was one of the largest signals we got out of the NAPA report. Uh, participating directly in decision making, I'm seeing this in all the visits that I've had uh, so far, touched uh, either visited directly or touched 28 forecast offices, and, and this is certainly happening, and so is that bottom line the whole office concept um, and the cultural shift associated with that as we take forecasts to the next level is certainly ongoing. Um, the, um, the case for change and why this is important, um, this is a case that rocked a lot of us. Um, in fact, one of the awards that we just heard about is related to this case. Uh, we had outlooks initiated uh, five to six days in advance uh, through SPC, uh, there were emergency management coordination calls uh, that began it, day three and some, day four and others, uh, at the national level, for example, with FEMA, um, at the regional and local levels through uh, the WFOs. Uh, clearly, people were preparing for this. We refined our forecast uh, highlighting uh, Alabama. Uh, you see the uh, watch. Uh, 96% uh, of the tornadoes occurred within the SPC watch. The average warning lead time coming out of the WFOs uh, was 24 minutes. It's a remarkable performance. Um, the, the sobering fact is that 311 people lost their lives. And um, the questions that we asked ourselves was why? Okay, why do we still have this? Is it, you know, is it just inevitable that if you have that many people living in a and uh, these tornadoes went right through highly populated areas that you're going to get this? Or are there actions that people took with a long lead time, a longer lead time, uh, that maybe we weren't expecting, okay, or that we need to better understand? And not just us, but the people we're working with. Uh, we had a, a, a conference, a workshop in Norman, Oklahoma, that involved physical and social scientists and involved first responders. Uh, it involved the locals from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and um, uh, Joplin, Missouri, uh, which was a real sobering experience listening to their uh, story. Um, it, it became increasingly obvious during the course of this workshop to focus on the last mile, the delivery of warnings, it, it, to provide warnings through this multiple uh, dissemination uh, outlets, um, taking advantage of the social media, the developing a social network uh, that are out there, um, and an understanding that it's not the day or the three days before the event, but it's, it's again, it's this, you know, as the Hurricane Center says, their busy season is the off season, and when they're doing their outreach and education. Um, how do we work um, when these events are not occurring um, to ensure that we get the, the response that uh, we're, we, we want, we all want? Well, there's been a lot going on uh, since then. We haven't sat, uh, sat back. Um, uh, we've uh, uh, testing the impact-based warning uh, um, in central region. Um, we've um, become more aggressive in responding to uh, requests, uh, especially from formal government entities. Uh, the National Scout Jamboree in West Virginia, when that occurred, it became the largest city, essentially, population-wise in the state of West Virginia, and um, we, um, 
we actually had an impact on that with respect to their final uh, concert, a collect, you know, their celebrative uh, concert at the end was to be held on a Saturday afternoon, or, uh, early evening. And that's right when, of course, we uh, were predicting a major severe weather outbreak. And uh, working with them the three days, two days, one day before that, a very orderly change in that concert time to the morning, uh, which was a fortunate thing because it was a, a major storm system ripped through that area in the evening. We have the pilot projects with emergency response specialists. Uh, we have uh, the Oklahoma tornado events in May 2013 now, two years after the 2011 outbreak. Um, a lot happened there. Uh, the connection between the Moore Medical Center and uh, Rick Smith, who I know is in the audience here, um, who won an NWA award for this um, activity, uh, worked out a plan. And that hospital, um, and that plan has its roots back to Joplin because that person took an initiative to visit Joplin, Missouri, to understand what that hospital did in the face of the tornado impacting that, you know, during that event, came back, hooked up with the local weather office, and they developed the plan and they practiced and they iterated. They changed the plan. They practiced, iterated, changed the plan. When the tornado hit that hospital uh, in Moore, uh, not only did they, uh, not, uh, no lives were lost for people who were in the hospital, but 300 people walked in that hospital off the streets uh, just as the tornado was bearing down on that area because they recognized this as a, one of the more stable structures. Uh, and all 300 of those people survived as well. Okay, so you have to, you have to uh, prepare uh, and be part of those preparations uh, before the event. And then Washington, Illinois, in November, again, you have the same sequence of events, four days, 36 hours, 12 hours. Um, and then, you know, the shift towards the west, it, again, there was some uncertainty in that, this forecast right up to a day and a half. Okay, this is it's one of the things we have to make sure people understand is that you might be more successful four days out on one storm system and then you're approaching this one between 36 and 12 hours, you're still adjusting. If they're with you during that adjustment, they understand. They're not going to hold you up, you know, to dry when they say, oh, you changed your mind 12 hours before an event. They un the people who are working with you tend to understand that process, okay? Uh, what was interesting here was uh, we've been working the multiple uh, dissemination, a lot of activities going on both out in the field and in more formal programs, and this was the wireless emergency alert that was issued um, that really focused in on where the tornadoes were going to occur. This is on a Sunday. People received this in their mobile homes and got, got into safe areas. They received it in church and got into safe areas. And uh, Goshen, Alabama sticks in my mind. I was the director of Office of Meteorology. This was back in the mid-'90s. Uh, that They took a direct hit. People knew to, there was a tornado threat um, but didn't get any kind of warning in the church, and over 20 people died, okay? So, you know, this got to get the message to the people direct, um, you know, for taking action. Okay, so... Um, the NAPA report, uh, the Congress, like I said, the Congress asked for this report. Um, there's, there are aspects of the, the request that seem to imply um, uh, that there might have been an expectation that this team could go out there and come back and say, here's, here's what the modern weather service will look like. Here's the number of forecast offices you should have, et cetera, et cetera. They came back. They didn't say that. What they said is that the future structure of the National Weather Service needs to be looked at in a very deliberate way, and uh, they recommended a deliberate pace of change, which involves all the stakeholders, uh, all your customers, all your partners, and specifically your union. Okay, they were very explicit about that. So we're in a process, we've just started the process uh, where we, um, Ed Johnson, who is standing over there, We'll be uh, going to Tampa in two weeks, uh, is it two weeks or three weeks, uh, to, to just discuss what, what is the process for change. And I can tell you that when I have to go brief this NAPA report on the Hill, the Hill gets it. In fact, there are still people on the Hill from the modernization that remind the young staffers there that the modernization process for change came about through a two public laws, okay? 
So we got a lot of work to do on the process for change. Um, and what I, what I hope to do is to build that process directed towards a future that deals with some of the examples like I just showed you, uh, where we're really focused on the, um, the, um, for, the um, impact-based decision support services across all of those items. Um, embrace, they embrace the Weather Ready Nation. And like I said, this is, uh, this is remarkable. This is, this is important to have your strategic outcome uh, embraced. And, and they embrace the six strategic goals. Uh, but they emphasize we can't do it alone. They recognize the secondary value chain. This is the public-private partnership uh, as, as a component of us becoming second to none. And this, um, you know, this gets focused very easily on the models. Uh, one of our challenges is to ensure that it looks at the entire product suite and the end result, which is our outreach to decision makers, that they're making the right decisions. Um, they recommend a centralized change management uh, in IT development. Uh, this is in response to their finding of 28,000 local applications on AWIPS as we have a contract in place to uh, morph from AWIPS 1 to AWIPS 2 and uh, without any structure to that. So this is a balance that one has to take in terms of change management uh, versus tapping into the local development. And you know, we have a lot of smart people out there. That's what we, we're real proud of, OK? How do, you, how do you manage that? So things like the, um, uh, the, the process we're testing through uh, OST, the virtual lab that allows people to come together virtually and start working their codes on a common basis. And the idea here is, is that if you have something really great that's being developed in your office, how can we more efficiently operationalize that across the entire weather service and not just in pockets? Because one of the things that this does, it gets, gets us up into the tactical finding, which is the lack of consistency. So we're, again, like I'm saying, people are saying over and over again they want a more consistent product suite from the uh, weather service. So we have to be able to manage that too. The open weather and climate for commercial and research sectors has to do with more ready access to the models. I've, you know, I've got the message loud and clear that this is also an issue with respect to our forecast offices. Okay? So we're, we're spending a lot of time. Dissemination has taken big hits over the last 10 years. Um, and a lot of what we have out there we've done to ourselves in response to that. So, um, you know, so when they say they want the model output, um, I'm saying, yeah, everybody wants the model output. So that's driving a lot of the uh, uh, activity as well. Uh, they recommend a federal advisory committee. Uh, this is um, uh, the FAC. Uh, these are, uh, they can take a, lot, a long time to staff up and, um, and, and actually create and then staff. Uh, we're in the process of, of uh, debating whether we create new ones or do we work off the existing ones or do we find other ways of getting uh, oversight of, um, and, and, and reviews. So that's an ongoing issue. Uh, they really emphasize the restructured transparent budget uh, that follows function. And that's something that I made as my top priority when I came in. This, this has to be done uh, to uh, better manage and to even discuss uh, the nature of our budget and, and how to move forward with it. And then to solidify the Noecio relationship, uh, there have been puts and takes on this. Uh, like I said, last year was a very difficult year. Uh, but we have uh, changes ongoing, including the restructured budget and the um, uh, the headquarters uh, restructuring. Steve Pritchett's sitting here. He's been, if he hasn't been at every meeting, I'd be surprised uh, because he can talk to this almost as well as I can. But this iteration needs to happen for us uh, to move over, and it's more than just a process thing. A lot of valuable insight that comes in that has uh, modified uh, the plans as they uh, as they move forward. Okay, so. Um, the budget process. Uh, I'm going to go over this. I have a few slides on the budget process. I, I, test, I test, uh, tested this down at Tampa last week, and nobody was looking at their, uh, their cell phones. And uh, they stayed, uh, they stayed uh, pretty engaged in this. And it's important uh, that we understand 
uh, what this budget process is, because I think there are some misperceptions about what happens after you hear that the appropriation law is signed. And uh, there's, there could be an assumption that that money just automatically appears uh, in our pockets and we're ready to go. You know, we're ready to start spending money. So the appropriation, that's the law. That's what you generally hear about. You know, so uh, when uh, the Congress finally passes a budget, and it, they don't do it every year, you know, that's where the continuing resolution comes in. Uh, but there has to be an appropriation with the president's signature on it before money starts flowing. Uh, we have two general categories. There are actually 17 categories in the National Weather Service. And I don't have the logic flow for all of those different categories. Uh, NOAA Weather Radio is in three of them. Uh, uh, SPC is in Central Forecast Guidance, but Space Weather Prediction Center is in Local Warnings and Forecast. Okay? So it, it, it's hard. Okay? It's hard to make sense out of it. But we have two principal um, uh, categories that we have to work through. We have the ORF, and we have the uh, Procurement and Acquisition, the PAC. The ORF is the base, and that's where the, um, uh, the salaries are paid, your salaries are paid out of ORF for the most part. Um, and then Procurement, Acquisition, and Construction, those tend to be short-term type projects. And short-term could be sometimes five to ten years, but the idea is that these projects have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, this money is then a portion, uh, a process that allocates or portions the money to the agencies from OMB. So in a sense, the money is flowing from the Hill to OMB and then to the agencies, like the Department of Commerce, okay, who then allot the money to us. And once that happens, uh, we can actually start spending. Now, in this case, this year, we're uh, in a parallel mode. The money hasn't quite hit yet, but we're, we've gotten to the allotment process to the point, and John will be able to explain this in, in more detail if we have to, but that process can take up to three months okay, before you're actually able to um, uh, spend the money. Uh, and this is a very strict, um, uh, in, in, in the apportionment, allocation, and allotting, uh, money within programs, projects, and activities, PPA. So you're going to hear me throw this PPA thing around. Once money is allotted into those, into those uh, categories, you can't move that money around from one category to the next without getting in serious trouble. So uh, let's look at 13. Um, this, this was probably uh, the harshest budget environment that um, I've ever gone through. And maybe it's because I was just seeing it from the top, but the budget uncertainty here was enormous. So um, the, uh, the fiscal 11, we had this recovery from the uh, fiscal, fiscal year 11 and 12 budget. I think everybody knows about the problems which cropped up, and I don't need to go into details here. Uh, we were working towards a new budget. Um, uh, and we were adopting the strategic goals uh, to help us drive us towards the new budget. Uh, I arrived in uh, uh, this time last year. Um, uh, I think it was uh, February 11th. Um, two weeks later, uh, the Sandy Supplemental hit. So, um, and this is a, um, as I said, on the phone calls I had in, uh, in February, March, April, into May, that this was a double-edged sword. Uh, as you'll see later, we had uh, over $90 million um, um, uh, allotted to the National Weather Service, um, but there was zero FTE in that budget. So in other words, I couldn't use any of that money for your salaries without a reprogramming. Okay? So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, in March, uh, and re reprogramming, by the way, has to go through that same pathway. You know, I don't write a letter to Mikulski. She loves me, but she's not going to open that letter, OK? So I got to go through NOAA, the department, to OMB, and they go to the Hill. And then that's discussed there, and then it comes back the other way. So that takes months. OK, so um, in March, Despite the fact that I was told in early March uh, that the sequestration won't possibly happen, they'll all come to an agreement 
at the end. The sequestration was enacted and a rescission, a 1.5% rescission was enacted um, in, in March, practically halfway through a fiscal year. And these were not focused on the PAC items. They were all focused on ORF. And the largest components of ORF are central forecast guidance and local uh, warnings and forecasts. So the laser goes right into those two categories that pay your salaries. Um, so a NOAA a, a initiated a, and implemented a hiring freeze in 2013. Uh, at that point, we were looking at potential furlough numbers on the order of 10 to 20 days. You know, if we if there was absolutely no reprogram, uh, NOAA did do um, uh, act, they conducted the activities within the limits that they're allowed to, and and we all settled on four days of furloughs across the board of all NOAA employees. So that was the plan. Um, up until about late June into July when the reprogramming effort, and it was after the Moore uh, tornado outbreak and the uh, President's visit, it became very clear that they were not going to allow the Weather Service to be furloughed. That's when we were getting our first clear signal. Okay, uh, But it wasn't until July that that appropriations reprogramming if that was going on in the background for months, it finally got uh, signed off and approved uh, in July. We didn't get the final allotments till late August. So you get in a sense for how this process works. So we, um, uh, we focused on those two categories as it relates to the uh, paying the employees. So the CF, uh, the central forecast guidance was enacted near the 100% level and the local warnings and forecasts were uh, enacted near the 99% level. And we'll show you the exact numbers that were left over uh, at, at the uh, October 1st, uh, what was there um, on October 1st. So uh, we hit October. I have a shutdown. I, I, I have 17 days. It felt like 17 days. It was actually 16 days. I've been corrected. Um, I was furloughed, too. It, I can tell you it was not a very pleasant experience. Um, but more importantly, um, as we, um, what that stopped, by the way, was the closeout activities on the budget, so we could even start getting into 14. And and it usually takes five days, October 4th or 5th, to do it. But since everything was stopped and had to be restarted, we lost two to three weeks just in that restarting activity. And then we had to focus. We weren't allotted money in the continuing resolution as if we were going to get the President's budget, we were on a continuing resolution um, at the fiscal year 13 sequestration level. So um, we had $125 million of, of an unobligated balance um, at that time. So out of that 125, there is uh, 71, uh, 350. That's the Sandy Supplemental. Now that's a two-year, for the ORF part, that's a two-year obligation cycle. These are paying for a lot of things, everything but federal employees. Okay. And then the non-Sandy supplemental is 53, uh, 392. So what we did here is just show you the larger items. If anybody wants to go through all the items, um, we can provide that. But uh, the Sandy supplemental items, uh, the central forecast guidance, the local warnings and forecasts, uh, these have to do mostly with the uh, contracting, the, the IT infrastructure, the com uh, computers, uh, things like that uh, that uh, can be obligated uh, over the, uh, uh, the computing support that can be obligated over the two-year period. WFO maintenance is also uh, up to $3 million. We were able to get money for the WFO maintenance based upon the damages that occurred uh, from, from Sandy up and down the East Coast. The non-Sandy supplemental, uh, these, um, uh, again, on the ORF, the top two lines have to do with uh, salaries, uh, only you know, 245K um, and then 9 million in the local warnings and forecasts. Part of this is related in, uh, to uh, overtime. Uh, we, we always uh, plan for overtime as we go into September, uh, given that, that we normally have a hurricane season. 
Uh, we didn't have one this year. Uh, and others have to do with the Workforce Management Office and the rate at which we could get, get things through that office, which we all know is a problem, and a problems which have been addressed by NOAA. We now have, for example, we now finally have a separate unit that's just dealing uh, with the National Weather Service. The other not uh, supplemental items, uh, aviation weather, AWIPS, NEXRAD, uh, the NOAA profiler network, the tsunami warning pro network, uh, these are all items that affect the way you can do your job. And this organization has had a history of tapping into, and there's dissemination aspects to this, tapping into these types of items to pay uh, for the uh, central forecast guidance and the local warnings and forecasts. Uh, we've, obviously, we, we want to stay within these uh, uh, categories, not just for the sake of, um, uh, of, of, of the law, but also because these are important for you doing your job. One of the strong messages I get from you folks is the dissemination issue. We've spent the last 10 years taking money out of dissemination to deal with the top, you know, to help with the top two lines, for example. So this is uh, something that um, uh, we had and we're managing to. Um, in the PAC uh, programs, by the way, trying to move something from PAC to ORF is, is almost impossible. Okay, so if you have flexibility, in the Hill, that's, um, that's something that, oh, I should point out that the uh, local warnings and forecasts, uh, a large part of that money in the Sandy Supplemental line is also the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program. And there was shifting of categories that needed to be done as part of that uh, reprogramming. So there was no way we could, um, we could allocate that money uh, by the deadlines that we had uh, on September 1st, I mean October 1st. Um, on the PAC, uh, the ground readiness and the weather and climate supercomputing, the ground readiness is dissemination uh, activity um, uh, to modernize our dissemination network. Is Louis Kano here? Louis in the back. He's a focal point for dissemination, so he's not only dealing with current problems, he's planning for the future. Um, and we have WFO construction, ASOS, AWIPS, the Cooperative Observing Network, legacy replacement, uh, and the weather and, and climate supercomputing as well. So, um, so you see the types of things that this money is geared for and will be appropriated during this fiscal year. Okay, so this fiscal year, um, we have, um, we not only got the President's budget, uh, we got um, 11, we got more than the President's budget. And I believe we're the only line organization in NOAA uh, that got more than uh, the President's budget. So this is, this is a very good budget. You see where the plus-ups are. Um, and we are set to spend these budgeted funds and accelerate the hiring. The freeze was lifted 131.14. We still have a process in place uh, as we prioritize um, the hires through the system. But we have a WFMO now unit that's focused on us, and we believe we'll be able to accelerate the hiring uh, uh, rate um, as this new money arrives. Um, so I've mentioned this, um, this uh, 17 uh, PPAs. It's very complicated. I mentioned the NOAA weather radio, the majority being in local warnings and forecasts and central forecast guidance. Uh, we have uh, had a history of moving money around those PPAs uh, to ensure that salaries uh, were paid. Uh, we can't do that anymore um, if you've been reading the papers. And the fact is, is that we now, if, if we want to move money around, we have to go through that reprogramming process, which is long. And uh, it, the percentage of, of, of times that they approve that isn't, isn't all that high. So you have to have a good reason uh, for doing it. The process of moving money from one PPA to another without congressional authorization and approved reprogram is against the law if it exceeds 500K or 10% of the PPA total, whichever is less. And one of the things that I said right from the beginning was I was going to manage and lead this organization within the con confines of the law. Okay, so okay, so what we're doing is, um, and this this will affect uh, you. Uh, we're working to simplify this structure, this uh, budget structure, um, and uh, what you see here are the five ORF uh, PPAs, which we now have delivered to uh, OMB 
uh, for the 15 budget. Uh, we've gotten very uh, supportive language back from them. We um, believe uh, these are going to get approved. Um, so it's observations, which involves uh, surface, ocean, upper air observations, aircraft, the next rad, ASOS, buoys, uh, radio sonds, snow surveys, profiles, the national mesonet observation support. There are FTE associated with that. So, so those that are involved with the observation programs will be in that, that uh, PPA. Uh, second is central processing, mostly the AWIPS. Uh, I mean, the, um, the central processing is the AWIPS model implementation on the supercomputing and the advanced hydrologic prediction system. We also have uh, data collection uh, display systems. All that will be in the uh, central processing. Um, so NCO, for example, will be in that PPA. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, forecast uh, office. Uh, so all now we get to analyze forecast and support. All the forecast offices in the National Weather Service are in this one PPA uh, with the WCM and the SDHs. That's where the word support comes in. So, so we can, uh, you know, the forecast office is not in this spread around the different PPAs. Uh, when it comes to your forecasting role, it'll be in, in there. And the outreach, the impact-based decision support services, for example. The IT uh, dissemination systems, all the, all the dissemination systems will be in that, the old and the new. And then the science and technology integration involves uh, the research development, assessing, environmental modeling centers in there, uh, the test beds, the pilots, the operational proving ground, uh, training, C-STAR, education outreach, and the SUE program and the DOE program. As far as PACs are concerned, you see there are three, um, 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 three categories that come out that are similar to the, uh, what we have there. So when we set up uh, what we had in the ORF, observation, central processing, and dissemination. So when we set up headquarters, we'll be managing observations, both PAC and ORF uh, from, one, um, from one office. Central processing will be managed from one office. Facility construction major repairs will be a unique uh, PPA, and that will be managed out of an office, and so will dissemination. When we did the portfolio, uh, some interesting things came out here. Um, uh, the budget categories, um, kind of interesting. So observations are 19% of our budget, about $205 million. Uh, the central processing is about 13%, it's 136 million. The analyzed forecast support is uh, 45% of 479 million. This is a lower number. When I showed this to OMB, they were surprised by the low percentage in, in that, uh, green, um, that green element. Uh, so, when we, so this tells me that as we define the functional aspects of this, I think it's actually going to make a stronger argument for the FTE counts that we have, um, because I think there's a perception that all the FTE is, uh, you know, is tied up in just the way we forecast. Okay, so um, this was good. It's 479 million. Dissemination is over 80 million, and we now got our arms around that. We have to manage dissemination. So for you not to have the bandwidth, and we've been spending 85 million dollars a year on dissemination. Something is broke, okay, so we got to fix that. And then the, uh, uh, the S &T uh, science and technology integration, that's 121 million, it's 11% of our budget that's involved in SCNI that, again, hasn't been effectively managed um, uh, from a, um, an agency perspective. We have 3% uh, in our common services and 1% in facilities, constructions, and major repairs, which I believe is um, uh, something that we need to look at. And I've been, for those who know me, have worked with me that since I've taken over the Weather Service, uh, we're trying to get this elevated. All right. So I've seen the Yuck book. I've seen what you, you folks have to work with. I've seen the situation out there. And we certainly need to address um, the facilities issue. Impacts on the field. Uh, uh, the analyzed forecast support, you know, working towards a fully integrated field structure is something that uh, we believe will give us a stronger uh, position uh, within the enterprise, um, and certainly will give us a um, you know working towards a more consistent stream, um, and allow you to tap, for example, via WFOs, allow you to tap in to the uh, support 
uh, both from the model stream and from the central offices in a much more effective way, and quite frankly, for them to be tapping into you um, as we move forward in these extreme events. Uh, we are supporting uh, forecasted training and development and outreach from the field level. Uh, dissemination uh, will be better managed, uh, reliable, centralized, and more responsive. The IDSS and social science, the nature of the work will change. So from a, tra uh, a training perspective, uh, the influence in IDSS will be really important. Uh, the ST&I provides a catch as to the rest of the community. Uh, allows you within your local offices, for example, in the CSTAR program is something that we're looking at to, uh, to bolster up and to work um, uh, through the proving ground so that what you find locally, again, can be have national implications more effectively. Uh, the AOP process will allow for more transparency in the budget, in the overall budget process. I, I'm involving all the managers, uh, the senior managers in the Weather Services 33 SESers in the National Weather Service, most of them acting right now. Um, and we um, have to engage them, and their charge is to engage you, to engage you in the office level so that you understand what's going on here. So um, the budget deal, what does this mean for the rest of 14 and for fiscal year 15? I think this is really tremendous news because, you know, up until the time that it became clear that this budget was going to get passed, which wasn't until after New Year's, um, we, we were planning, remember, the, we were under a continuing resolution, and we were looking at another 4.5% sequestration and the Graves Amendment that had us at an 11% cut. That was the law if this didn't become the law, okay? The NOAA hiring freeze uh, has ended, and uh, we're now uh, proceeding uh, uh, accordingly. And... Um, you know, how can we measure uh, the change with the annual operating plan? Yes, we expect to um, accelerate our improvements, our outreach, our connection uh, with uh, those uh, partners out there. But um, right now, uh, what, I'm, what I'm fighting for is this increased transparency in the budget and planning process so that um, people on the Hill have uh, confidence in what we're doing uh, with respect to spending according to the plan. Uh, and as an increased logic flow for planning, securing, and defending the budget. Uh, travel update, you're here. Okay. This was a major effort. Charlie, I'm going to ask you. I didn't, I didn't warn him I was going to do the stand-up. So Charlie Woodrum is our PCO. He spent a Herculean effort not only in collecting the information from you to allow us to defend the 151 NWS, but the 293, we were the focal point for all of NOAA, okay? And we had to defend that at the department level before we got the agreement. And we wanted that agreement early enough so that you could plan for your meeting here. So Charlie deserves a round of applause, please. <laughs> the WCM uh, CH meeting, uh, this is important, obviously, to attain the weather uh, ready nation goal. We had to make a decision. This conference was going to happen even if we were under a continuing resolution. We have to have this. We have to demystify social science. We have to get this type of activity into every office. The WCM is your conduit for this. Uh, so we have the week of June 9th through 13th. It will be at College Park in the new uh, NOAA Center for Weather and Climate Prediction. For local travel, uh, we are increasing the local travel. Uh, for the decision support activities, you're, you're, you're working with the local state emergency management center. I got that message loud and clear in my visits uh, out there as well. Uh, the operational support, um, you know, I heard about the trip from Long Island to Connecticut. Uh, is not a simple trip to make. That's not a one-day wonder uh, as an example, okay? Uh, we have to do this. And then uh, that local outreach. Okay. Uh, it's a, a news flash. Uh, this Pathways program has been approved uh, to replace the SCAP step, uh, which we could not proceed with. This is the allotment, the initial allotment uh, per region, per office. We have 85 at 10K. This is to get students FaceTime with you. I know a lot of you have been, have been tremendous with students in your office. It, it really is a great deed that you're doing, not only from their prof professional development, but a lot of these students enter uh, the National Weather Service. So we have 85 at 10K per slot. 
they are they are advertised through USA Jobs and veterans preferences will apply uh, to these positions. Um, and I'll leave go through this quick. It's just that there is you know all this has been advertised. There's a lot of excitement at the student conference on Saturday uh, when we rolled out this uh, this program. Sandy Supplemental, we got $97 million. They just didn't throw it over the transom and say, go spend $97 million. We had to iterate a plan, again, from NOAA to the department to, to OMB, back to the Hill, and then back down. I think that iteration went on for two or three or four months. Bill, the pencil sitting in the front row, you were one that had great enjoyment uh, out of this. Um, but these were the kinds of areas we were able to get money for, designed to improve response, resiliency, recovery, and preparedness. And while I'm at it, Bill, why don't you stand up? Um, Bill is the sixth director of the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. <laughs> one of the big things, one of the main goals written right into this money is, is to catch the European model. Okay? And, it, uh, you know, the, the fact is there are a lot of people on the Hill that measure us by one score, and that's the 500 millibar um, score. It's not fair. It's not. It, it doesn't represent what we do in its entirety. But you know, it is. That is what it is, and we have to. We have to address it. Uh, we've just um, gone up to two hundred and eight uh, um, teraflops. Uh, we are uh, looking to get up to two petaflops, hopefully by the end of fiscal year fifteen. That's where where most of that computing money is going for the Sandy Supplemental. I got a question mark, obviously, once the European Center heard what we were doing. They're not sitting on their hands, okay? We don't know exactly where they're going to wind up, but it's going to be greater than 1900, okay? They have a lot more flexibility in working their computing money than, than we do, even though they, you know, they have to report to 17 countries, okay? Uh, these are the types of models we're working to implement. Uh, I think the... Um, not only increasing the resolution of the GFS, but extending that higher resolution out to 10 days. You can't get good, consistent six, seven, and eight-day forecasts um, if that's when you're changing your resolution. The HRR will be implemented. Uh, that's the high-res rapid refresh. Um, that'll happen early on in the process. We're looking at the end of this fiscal year still, Bill, or yeah, we're still looking at the end of the, this fiscal year for both of those models. We start getting into the higher resolution ensembles that, that could push out. The hurricane models are, will be run at three kilometers, and we're accelerating the, the uh, storm surge. So um, in summary, we're a science-based service organization. Um, I've emphasized that since the day I arrived, and I will continue to do so. So um, you know, we have to not only reach out to our uh, users and uh, um, our customers, but we have to reach back to our science community writ large to enable us to uh, continue to advance. Uh, the strategic goals will define the way forward uh, toward the Weather Ready Nation. Uh, so we're looking at all six of those goals as being important. The NAPA review embraced it, but they said we can't do it alone. The budget headquarters restructuring is, is, is a high priority, and it's really my highest priority uh, to make this organization work. Uh, will support the way we operate within a fully integrated field structure. And it really does, and, and I'm not getting into the headquarters restructuring here, but it really will keep the field structure, what I call it, the tip of the spear, and make sure that the rest of the organization is supporting uh, you getting your job done. Uh, we're optimistic about fiscal year 14 and beyond, but recognize there are still on, ongoing uncertainties. And I want to just, I think I got the newspaper in here. I can find it. Yeah. I just, you know, the, the other week I, um, I got, you know, you get this Federal Times. It's one of the, you know, one of the most read papers in, inside the Beltway. But the headline, budget, the, what the headline is about the budget deal, budget deal offers needed stability. And in my mind, that, is, that has been the biggest challenge for me, um, and I think for us, getting through the last year because it was totally unstable. We just... We went from week to week, month to month, not knowing exactly what bottom line we were managing to. So um, I'm really looking forward uh, to working with this. And, and this budget deal uh, gets us through 15, so I suspect uh, we'll be in a more stable regime um, uh, through the next two fiscal years. Okay, thank you for your attention.
So at this point, I'd like to invite Dan uh, to the to the mic. Well, th thank you, Louis, for uh, inviting me up here. Um, I, I do appreciate the invitation. I do appreciate uh, you reaching out over the last month, uh, trying to open doors with uh, labor relations. Uh, just one question is if the Weather Ready Nation ambassadorship to Barbados is still open. I, I know a guy uh, for you. Um, I, I, it was a great um, presentation you gave. Um, but I, I don't, it didn't answer some of the, the, the questions that I, that I think people really are concerned about. It. I don't think people are concerned about money being left over at the end of 2013. I think people are concerned about the priorities of the National Weather Service, that spending plans and reprogrammings don't take into account the needs of people at RFCs and WFOs and CWSUs and tsunami warning centers and NSEP centers around the country and, 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 and the real hurting that, that they are feeling right now. And, and, and let me just kind of go through uh, just a brief um, summary. Some of you know we've had an arbitration just a couple weeks ago uh, concerning the Weather Service not filling vacant positions. And, and let me give you just a little background on how that happened and, and the information we found out about it. Uh, in 2012, we started noticing that positions weren't being filled at the National Weather Service. Uh, training was cut. There was budget problems. Everybody understood that. But the reason we were all, always given for the positions not being filled was that there were problems at WFMO, and they couldn't process it, and there were all sorts of issues going on. So we accepted that to a large extent. There, you know, what are you going to do about that? Um, but, but late in the year, we started suspecting something's not right here. Uh, so, so we did an information request. And as part of that information request, we found out that, the, no, it's not a problem at WFMO. The problem was the National Weather Service wasn't submitting vacancies to WFMO. The National Weather Service, this was way before sequestration. This was before the hiring freeze. This was something, this was what the National Weather Service, the National Weather Service instituted its own little mini hiring slowdown through that, that process. In addition, you know, every office lost their vehicles, uh, critical safety training was cut, uh, the IMET training course, the ones that teach them how to save their lives if they get caught in a fire, they were cut. Nobody was sent to it anymore. Um, one region even stopped doing uh, storm surveys unless it was a major tornado event. We were pretty much cut and not allowed to do our jobs anymore, and, and, and we felt kind of hamstrung. Uh, we, we were getting absolutely no information from management on it. And, you know, it, we really seemed to have this problem because they seemed to have plenty of money to do other things. The, the, there was a priority to go to Congress with the Sandy Supplemental and ask for supercomputers, but not about filling jobs. So we filed grievances, three of them, uh, and, 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 and a fourth one after um, a fourth one after the hiring freeze was announced, and, and, and they didn't refuse to negotiate it with us. And, and, and the reason is that things just didn't add up for us, because the Weather Service actually got more money in local warnings and forecasts, the PPA that Louis brought up uh, that pays for most of our salaries, uh, not all of them, but most of them. It got more in 2012 than it did in 2011. And while sequester was really tough, I, th I think it cut, what, what is it, about $40 million or, or, or so out of local warnings and forecast. The National Weather Service was actually given $17 million more that year to kind of give a little buffer for that. And in addition to that, there was an increase of lapsed labor of over $40 million from the year before. So we should have been able to weather that storm, and we just couldn't figure anything out. 
So we filed the grievance. Um, and, and during that time also, it wasn't like, OK, yeah, I understand that, that reprogramming is tough. You got to go through OMB with it. But at the same time, Congress actually was writing letters to the acting Secretary of Commerce saying, hey, please reprogram. We want the Weather Service to have what it needs in the right stacks. Um, OK, so um, we filed these three grievances. And as part of the arbitration, it was the agency. It wasn't us. It was the agency that brought up that there was money left over at the end of 2013. Now, Louis is absolutely correct. The, the, the money came late. Um, the, 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 you know, there wasn't enough time to spend it. However, they knew it was there in August. And, you know, and certainly there was some confusion up until mid-October about, um, about whether or not, well, I mean, we were all lived it. Well, I mean, the government shut down. There was all sorts of problems. However, before that whole thing, in September, the, the, the CJS budget was agreed to by both the House and the Senate. And both of those marks were really good for the National Weather Service. We knew our budget was going to be good once we made it through all of this. Plus, we had $125 million surplus left over from the year before. Plus, I just learned this the other day, there was carryover money in 2012 also. So the money was there. It would have taken a reprogramming for much of it. And it did take a long time, but you know what? It's, they knew that in August. They knew this when they submitted their spend plan, that there wasn't enough to keep vacancies from being yeah, over 500 vacancies, roughly, in, in the weather service right now. And it's February 5th right now. We're halfway through the second quarter of 2014, which is a great budget year. Somebody with a phone going USA Jobs right now, how many ET positions are there? Uh, not there? How many HMT positions or hydrologists or uh, meteorologists or ASAs? I, I, I looked recently. I didn't see any. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I don't want to go through a whole bunch of, of stuff. I, 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 think it was, I think it was important to, to let you all know uh, where we were coming from, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm just kind of discouraged that here we are in February and, and people are still not being hired. Uh, your offices are, are uh, being told. People are still today, not today, yesterday, being told, hey, bring pens in from home. We don't have any money in the office budgets. Uh, cars were taken away. Bandwidth, people have to do their training at home because their cell phone has more bandwidth in it than their entire WFO, and and kind of we're being told, wow, it's wonderful. We get these new computers. We're gonna have teraflops and whatever. I don't even know what that stuff means, um, and and it really means nothing to them because they're having a real hard time just doing their job. So I, I don't know. I I don't want to get up here complaining. I, I I saw that presentation. It just kind of made me thinking all of this, and and I don't think anybody has any evil intent or anything. In fact, I think. Uh, uh, Louis is a wonderful man. I've, I've known him for a, a long time, and I, I think he really does care about us a lot. Um, I, I just I think that that perhaps priorities are wrong, and 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 maybe um, maybe you don't quite have the right feel for for the the problems that people are having out there, just just doing their job on a day to day basis when. Literally, people are being told, we don't have money to buy pens. So uh, that, I mean, that's all I really had to say. But, but I do think, I, I really, you know, uh, things are looking up. The, the, um, uh, we've had we've several communications recently and, and, uh, and very positive steps forward. Um, hopefully, we can work forward with Ed and, and, uh, and Chris Drager on, on, on moving forward with, with Agency and, 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 and just as a, a final note, um, Louis, you noted when you were in Tampa that you think you saw the future of the National Weather Service. I just want to remind you that it was about five years ago, roughly to this day, that the National Weather Service and the union sat down together and designed that future of the National Weather Service. If we did it then, we can do it again. 
Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, uh, before we open up for questions, I, I just want you to know I share his concerns. We, we, we can argue about the historical aspects of 11 and 12 and, and, and the impact of what was discovered at the end of 11 on 12 and the way uh, we had to recover um, with uh, no sympathy from either the from commerce or, um, or from the Hill. We had to solve our own problems. And um, we, we got ourselves in that situation. And, I, I, and um, things like, you know, when you mentioned the dissemination, it is awful uh, that we have dissemination issues that you can't even do your training. You can't do your administration work. Those were the kinds of things that were given up to account for what happened in 11 into 12. So I don't want to manage the weather service that way. You know? So I absolutely share his frustrations. Um, and that's why I believe that, and that's why I focused on this budget structure um, and, and what needs to be done with it so we have clear uh, paths, we have clear communication. Um, when we have observation issues, we deal with observation issues, not with that, not uh, at the expense of analyzed forecast support. Okay, because the way it's structured now, that's that's what will happen. Okay, so um, I'm ready to move forward in this arena and in this uh, planning process that uh, we've been laying out and the types of things, the process, uh, the way we even move forward. We're ready to bring the right people down to the Labor Council meeting at Tampa to discuss that. Uh, whether we're meeting the right priorities or not on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, we're, we are inviting Dan and Bill to attend the annual operating plan meeting again. Uh, uh, we're, having, uh, we're going to have this meeting every year. It's, it's going to become part of the governance of the Weather Service that we get the annual operating plan in the spring before the fiscal year starts, we get that mapped out so that we are addressing the priorities of the, uh, of the organization. And we have an open invitation to Dan and Bill to be active members in that discussion, in that meeting, uh, because that does set the framework for uh, moving forward. If we get the President's budget, for example, for 15, all right, and hopefully get it a lot sooner than January, all right, so you got the open invitation to be part of that meeting. Uh, it is a very important meeting, and we want to be able to walk out of that meeting saying we are addressing the, uh, the priorities um, of the field structure, that analyzed forecast support is driving all those other budget categories. So um, that's my intent. I mean, that's what I want. I don't want to come up with a budget and then find out halfway through a fiscal year that we're not addressing the proper priorities. So one of the like so one of the messages I got from the trips that I've taken. By the way, I wasn't traveling during the summer. I wa it was killing me. All right, that I couldn't get out. But I wanted to hear what I started hearing in the in September into the fall. I heard dissemination. All right. So when we got to the point of maybe we can combine central processing and dissemination together into one one PPA. I said no. You know, I want that dissemination there so we can focus on that and argue for those needs as an example. Okay. So, I, Dan, I share your frustrations. And um, I'm trying to make this work. And um, I'm inviting you to be actively engaged in this uh, annual operating plan meeting. And we're sending the right people to the Labor Council so we can start mapping from day one this process, you know, for, even, for whatever process we come up with for the changes that, that we know we need to make uh, in terms, and I say we collectively, uh, to position this agency uh, to you know, get us into the warning support in ways that, uh, that we all want. OK, so with that, um, uh, I probably, we're, I know we're over time, but I don't see anybody else lining up outside the. Uh, and, right, and, and, we, and, and we would ask if anyone uh, here in the room has any questions, please step up to the microphone and, uh, and identify yourself uh, prior to when asking the question. I'm Bill Hopkins. I'm the Vice President of the Union. 
And since this was not directly open to the field for calling questions, they have sent me a couple of questions to ask you. The first one is, can you please explain what fully integrated field structure means? Because they have no idea what you're talking about. And also, are you planning on closing field offices? Okay, so the second question is no. Okay, there are no plans. So, so the point is, this is why we were very, uh, this is why this meeting, this Labor Council is really important because we just want to start the discussion on that process. So the answer to the second question is no. All right. The, uh, an example of the fully integrated field structure, as, as an NSEP director for 14 years, pulling together uh, seven service centers, I felt that those were underutilized resources to support the field, the rest of the field. And it wasn't fully integrated with what the field needed or could access from them. Okay? One of the reasons I believe we have inconsistent products out there is because we're not fully integrated. So, um, so that's one example. And, and um, I believe that there are things that can be done uh, in WFOs uh, work, and can be done better working off of and collaborating with uh, the, uh, the, the central offices, for example, and better things that will come out of the central office for that same collaboration that will ensure a, a better products and, and services. Okay. Can we get a commitment from you that filling vacancies will be a top priority and that holdups by WFMO will just not be accepted? The, uh, the answer is yes. The, um, the, um, one of the things that Laura has done um, in working with the WFO, WFMO and is to get that separate group, okay, that is focused on our needs. And we're looking for ways through our CFO office to try to accelerate uh, that effort. And I don't know if Laura, if you want to step up, or if John, you want to say a few comments about some of the ways, you know, we can do the announcements so we can, you know, get multiple, you know, uh, filling of, 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 of positions. John? Yeah, <clears throat> Louis, uh, we're going to meet with the Director of NOAA Workforce Management next week to talk about uh, those efficiencies and ways to streamline the hiring process. Uh, that includes not just trickling over vacancy announcements each week, but coming up with a, a master list that's prioritized that we can uh, ensure uh, our workforce management folks that this is the top priority of the Weather Service and we need these all to hit as soon as possible. Number two is to try to um, incorporate open and continuous announcements for the same job series where at all possible so that we're not having to reissue the same types of vacancy announcements over and over again, but that we can do it in more of a, uh, a blanket fashion. So um, meanwhile, the, uh, the regional directors have come up with a, um, a prioritized hiring uh, methodology that we're implementing and we're going to incorporate that in all the hiring lists that we uh, that we put forward. So that's that's what we're looking at. Okay, and I should note that in the meeting we had in Tampa with Dan that we want to discuss that um, at the labor. That's one of the agenda items at the uh, labor council meeting. So um, that whole that whole process, the upfront process, we're going to have a discussion about that. Okay, uh, we have another question. Joshua Sheck from Bismarck. Um, first, thanks for finally opening this back up. We're, we're reorganizing our AOP to, um, to essentially fight for the dollars and tie the AOP to the budget that we get. How does that place us if we don't get a budget in time to execute the AOP? How do we react okay. to that? So imagine what it was like back in June of last year, all right? And we were in tough times, and uh, so we got the president's budget, and there were many who said don't even plan to the president's budget because you're not going to see that. Uh, we chose to exercise this whole process to the president's budget. First of all, it was the only budget we had. It was the only bottom line we had to work with. Um, and... Um, uh, so we did that, but at the same time, we we had to put a scaling function in there 
to be able to manage. So, so in developing the priorities uh, during that process, if we got if if we would have been in a continuing resolution the whole year, we would not have had the president's budget that we would have been able to still use the same process to manage with the idea that the bottom line would be moving up. Of course, we would do a body check each time that happened. So we were scaling that. Uh, we were looking at uh, priorities, uh, major, you know, major things that would have to be done even under a continuing resolution. And I'll tell you just three things that came up out of the June meeting. One was uh, the, water, the water center in Alabama. Okay. The second one was AWIPS, too. We had to do an AWIPS, two deployment by the end of fiscal year 15. So we had to have a focused effort on that. And a third one was the WCM conference. And you might say, why that? OK, because you know, as you all know in your forecast offices, is that decision support services is happening. This cultural shift for the whole office uh, approach is happening, right? Uh, we've got to get the WCMs, you know, as sort of a, you know, so, sort of a, a force within those forecast offices that can bring back material because we all are struggling with what does social science mean? How is this really going to help us? We got to start approaching that issue and take the, you know, first of all, demystify that aspect of it, but also the lessons learned from 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 offices that are actually, um, you know, conducting this and doing it successfully. How do we spread that around? So things like that, we said, look, even if we're in the continuing resolution, we're still going to do those things. I have to tell you that if we, and I said this before January 15th when I was out at Western Region offices and in other places, that if we hit 15 and they didn't have a budget agreement, and I can tell you before Christmas, they were still not sure, um, at least they were saying publicly, um, and we went into that sequestration and, and the uh, Graves Amendment, we were in big trouble, OK? The total cut would have been 11%. So that takes us off the chart. And that, you know, I could tell you the annual, the annual operating plan process, as much as I loved it, probably would have been blown up as well. I mean, we would have, it would have been horrible. So, but we are trying within the normal scheme of, you know, things, the normal range, have this process so you know you can scale it as you're developing, which is why when Dan makes the point about ensuring the the priorities that are needed by the field, that we have a full understanding of those, because when we come out of this meeting in uh, in May, right? Are we saying May, early May this year? We got to get it earlier than last year. That we have a we have a sense of what those priorities are. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come to the conference, open this up, and just seeing all the signs out here is just motivating. Um, staff the recent boat show, and uh, every other person uh, came up at the boat show talked about asking for it. And uh, this is a sentiment, too, that I'm hearing from emergency. I was wondering. They're looking at to get uh, the application from us because we're a trusted source. Good thing. I was wondering if you're aware of any uh, effort in the dissemination PPA to include development of a national web or if you can consider it. OK. Um, so Jim normally asks the tough questions. And, and he, he, didn't, he didn't disappoint. Um, so on the apps, you know, I'm, I'm of uh, two minds here. And I'm, I haven't cross-checked this with Louie, and he'll probably run up here and gag me at some point. So I won't get too far down the line. But here's, here's what we're facing on the apps. There are many, many companies out there developing apps for mobile devices that are weather-oriented. So point question number one, can we really keep up with that rate of change? Okay. The biggest issue, all of these folks, they, you know, I go to the AMS conference. The summer conference has more of a private sector emphasis to it, so I really get a sense of what they need. Um, the apps is a big deal for them. And when they come back to us, part of their problem with us is that 
we haven't standardized our input to them. Okay, uh, from a WFO perspective, and even from a uh, a regional perspective, and you know, as much as this hurts from a national, since you know, I haven't managed this for 14 years, from a national center perspective. So them, the one thing that 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 keeps us on the block with these folks is that we provide free and open access. So they really want our stuff, okay? And they want it to be done in a way that gets the maximum information out. So we all have the same goals. So, so one part of me says, you know, can, should we be using our precious resources to try to compete with about 100 companies, right? Or should we? ensure that we're listening to what they need so we can ensure that they're accessing our products and services, not somebody else's. Okay? So that's part of the equation here. The, but, but then, of course, there's the branding aspect, which we were just discussing today, you know, which is a big deal. I understand that's a big deal. And part of the desire to have our own apps is also the brand. So we're trying to sort our way through that. Um, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak for Louis because uh, uh, we're still developing the plans for the dissemination, and you know he's probably spending. You can tell he's lost some hair lately. You know, just on the, just on the current. I can. I can get away with saying that. Some people can't, right? Uh, but just you know, trying to understand the current outages, and 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 we've had three different outages in three different regions for three different reasons during major outbreaks, major weather events, right? I'd rather focus our dissemination on that, ensure a, 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 um, a consistent data stream that gets these hundreds of apps out there accessing us because we are the most consistent and the best products around for them to be tapping into. So, you know, that's, that's an approach, um, and, it, and it will drive decisions. But I think um, you know the more we discuss this, the more we um, iterate this under the dissemination aspect, uh, we'll have that platform to continue having this discussion. Yeah, like project one way up here. I'm Frank Alzheimer. I'm the Science and Operations Officer at the Charleston, South Carolina National Weather Service Office. And um, obviously, with the uh, budget issues we've had over the past years, uh, training has uh, taken a significant hit um, to the fact where just about all of our residence training classes have disappeared, um, obviously putting a burden on the Sioux. Um, I'm concerned about this big train that we have had in our direction a couple of years called GOZAR. Um, it's a very heavy investment by NOAA. Um, there's an awful lot of data. I would argue it's the biggest advancement in our remote sensing capability since the 88D. And yet, um, to date, the training has been rather scattered in different places. There hasn't been a real organized effort. And uh, when you're looking at something that's this large, um, I think we really need to make sure that we're getting this done ahead of time so as soon as that data hits our systems, we're able to use it to the best of our ability. And uh, so I'm wondering if there's any, what are the plans or comments on, on dealing with this particular issue? OK, so thank you for that question. I, and I, again, I appreciate your concern on this matter. Uh, so imagine, uh, so let me make a few comments first. Imagine uh, the concern I have uh, when my boss um, has me sit down with her and sign you know, documents in terms of my performance plans and and everything else that, um, you know, and, and one of the priorities for the agencies are billion-dollar observing systems, B. And, and, and don't forget JPSS, you know, with an S at the end of the billion, okay? Uh, we have to be ready uh, for, the, uh, for these observing systems. Um, so with respect to GOES-R, you know, geostationary data has more of an influence on forecast offices than polar orbiting, although that's changing. Okay, historically, it, people look at GOES for forecast offices, TV stations, you know, things like that, and polar orbiting satellites for models and for Alaska. Okay, essentially the polar orbiters become the G 
geo platform for Alaska. So, so what this is starting to morph. You know, more people are accessing uh, polar orbiting data now for local applications. Fire, uh, you know, uh, fire behavior is 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 a, a growing example of that. Okay, uh, for use of polar. Um, for geo, uh, it's the, as you say, we've got 16 channels in Gozar that you're going to have access to potentially. You know, we get this dissemination. He, uh, Louis got the ground readiness program, which uh, we wanted to preserve because we wanted to be ready for this. Uh, 16 channels, every um, every at least every five minutes. Okay. Wow. So what is? Oh, and now we, we also have the potential of using this in the models because we're also now, as part of the Sandy Supplemental, we're working to accelerate the implementation of a 4D uh, data assimilation system, not you know, conjured up inside of NCEP. This is a research-oriented system that's coming from NCAR, ESRO, and NCEP, and we're working to accelerate that. One of the drivers for that on a global basis is a Gozar capability. So we've got a lot of technology work to do, and we have a lot of training to do. Uh, when I took over OM and we had goes next, remember what the expression was, was plan for no goes. And I came into OM and I said, we're planning for yes goes. We had no training plan, and we started this spin up out of the Comet. So we had those folks in. Uh, every time I say a month, I get the wrong month, much less the day. So I'm just going to say December, OK? It was in that time frame. What's your training plan? So uh, the discussion I remember is that most of the training uh, that they were bringing to the table as part now is of the training plan for this annual operating plan for 14, Ogren was at the table uh, representing the cross training needs, OK? What's the training plan? Most of the training was focused on the web base. I wanted to see, yes. We need that, but we also need uh, on-site training. Um, I wanted to build that back up, much like we do for the radar program. I think the radar program had it right. Um, it, during the modernization, with the dual pole coming on, I wanted to see the same thing with the goals are. It's going to have that big of an impact. Uh, and it's not just to look at images. The derived products that one can get from these 16 channels. I just saw an example when I went out to the um, I saw it both at the Aviation Center, uh, the Ops Center in Herndon, and I saw it down in Tampa. Is this fog pro uh, product, and, and where you can time when that fog's going to lift, OK? It's an amazing product. That has satellite basis for it. It was, de it was designed, uh, uh, tested under the Gozar Proving Ground, OK? So it's these kinds of things I, you know, are, are pretty exciting. and. We have to make sure that our people are trained not only to what they're looking at, but what are the derived products that they can get from it. Get to the mic. I don't know how much longer we yeah, have. And, uh, and, and uh, while Chris is making his way to the microphone, what I will just do is remind people that uh, we've gone a half hour over. But if there are any questions that have not been asked, uh, uh, Answer. For people on the phone uh, or in the room, please follow up with an email to nws.communications.office at noaa.gov, and we will, as always, provide answers to any to any of those questions that you have. Uh, Chris, just real quick to follow up with that, we, we do recognize that's going to be a huge lift. Uh, the Office Training Division, OS6, uh, we have put together a draft training plan for Gozar material, not just to get the material, but how are our, our forecasters going to be able to utilize this to, in, in their daily jobs? So Leroy Spade has taken the, uh, the, the, uh, the lead on that. And Louie, that was one of the, the myriads of brief things that we went uh, to get you uh, late last month. So, it's, so it was, uh, was it April or January? I can't remember. January. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so to, to answer the question, though, we do have that under control. We, we do understand it's coming up quick, but we are working on it. Great. Thank you, everybody, um, and enjoy the rest of the uh, AMS conference. Yeah, thank, uh, and thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. And operator, if you're still on the phone, can you tell me how many lines, uh, how many people are on the line if the operator is still on the, on the call? Absolutely. I'm still here. We had about 346 participants.